episode five, British expressions from my life as a son of goat farmers. I come from five generations of English farmers and somehow I ended up becoming a language teacher here in Brazil. This is why in this episode, I'm going to teach you six British expressions from my memories of life growing up as the son of goat farmers. This is the story of how my parents started with just three goats and through a lot of dedication, sweat and passion, succeeded in building a goat business empire. If this is the first time you are listening, then please let me introduce myself. I am James, and I created this podcast with the purpose of helping my students improve their English comprehension, as well as learn new vocabulary and expressions. If you find this episode difficult to understand, then I recommend reading the free transcript available on my website at schoolofduda.com. I will begin this story with where my parents came from as this will give you a little context as to why their lives took the path I'm about to explain. My mum grew up on a farm in the little English village of Oakley, in the county of Bedfordshire. Her parents produced cow's milk and grew crops such as wheat and maize. When my mum was ready to leave home, she decided she wanted to experience a different life, and she was determined not to marry a farmer. She moved 150 miles north to the county of Cheshire and started a new job working at the Atomic Energy Authority. My dad was also born on a farm. His family were pig farmers. According to my dad, his childhood involved working on the farm all day, every day, and they had very little time for anything else. He would tell me stories of how he and his brother Paul would spend all day picking potatoes in the fields by hand. It was back-breaking work. They were happy enough, but despite all the hard work, the money did not come easy for his family. As a result, his parents encouraged him to do something else with his life. Do anything you want, they said, just don't be a farmer. So when he left home, he became a salesman and would drive all over Cheshire selling animal feed. My parents met in 1979. My dad made my mum laugh, and she thought he was charming. She agreed to go on a date with him, but only because he wasn't a farmer. Secretly, my dad's dream had always been to farm. Farming was his great passion in life. Though, as a young man, he could never imagine how anyone could ever get enough money together to buy their own farm. Having his own tractor was about as big as he dared to dream. He was wise enough not to mention his ambitions to my mum in the beginning. Only after she married him did he share his master plan for becoming a goat farmer. Despite goats being a common source of milk and meat in South America, Africa, Asia and the Middle East, back then, in 1980s England, practically nobody was farming goats. There were a few hobby farmers making goat's cheese, but certainly no one producing goat's milk on a large scale. When my dad told people of his idea to start selling goat's milk, almost everyone laughed at him. When someone in the UK wanted milk, Nobody would ask which type, because pretty much cow's milk was the only option. But there was some logic behind my dad's daft idea. He found out that around 10% of the population were not able to drink cow's milk because of allergies or intolerances. So he thought that goat's milk might just be a good alternative. In 1985, I was born. My older sister had already arrived almost two years earlier. Together, we lived in a little white cottage on a small farm in the middle of Delamere Forest. Looking back, I couldn't imagine anywhere more perfect to spend the first years of your life. It was every bit like a beautiful English fairy tale, as it sounds. There was no fence that separated where our garden ended and where the forest began. So for me, the forest was my garden, and I was let free to explore and play in my own little world. I will include some images of Delamere Forest from my childhood in the transcription for anyone who would like to see for themselves. My dad worked as a farm manager for a businessman and his wife. His job was to raise cattle for meat, 
while keeping everything looking tidy and pretty for the boss's family, who also lived on the farm in the big White House. That same year, my parents bought their first three goats and began learning to make cheese in their kitchen. My dad told his boss about his business idea and he kindly agreed to allow my parents to keep some more goats there. These were the humble beginnings of their adventure into goats. My parents invested every penny of their savings into buying goats and equipment. They didn't really know what they were doing, so they had to learn as they went. By the end of the year, they had no money left, no real customers, and everyone still told them that there was no future in farming goats. But my parents were young, happy, and at this point had nothing else to lose. I was only a few years old, but I still have clear memories of this special time spent living in the forest. I was surrounded by animals and nature. Life in the forest was very peaceful, and I believe this played an important part in developing my personality and ultimately shaping the person that I became. It is also the reason why I feel a little guilty that I'm raising my daughter in a concrete city like Sao Paulo, with not even a garden for her to escape to. Delamere Forest gave my parents an idyllic start to their journey. It was an extremely picturesque, calm and happy place. It also gave them the name for their new company, Delamere Dairy. But this peaceful time hidden away in the forest did not last forever. When I was six, we moved to a new farm on the edge of a small town called Nutsford, about 20 miles away. My parents had outgrown Delamere Forest. By now, some of the supermarkets were starting to take an interest in their product and began selling goat's milk in their stores. Soon, there were too many goats making too much noise and it was disturbing the peace and quiet of the forest. Both my dad and his boss knew it. It was time for us to leave and take our 200 goats with us. The new farm was part of the Crown Estate, which is a company responsible for managing all the land that belongs to the British royal family. Effectively, we lived on one of the farms owned by the Queen, and as a result, had to pay her rent every month. This was a very exciting opportunity for my parents. Now they had their own farm and the space they needed to grow their business. It is important to mention that during all this time, their business still didn't actually make any money. In fact, it would be many more years before they would see the fruits of their labor. This is the first expression, and it is used to describe the reward you receive for your hard work and effort. They had no choice but to grow their business, otherwise it would fail. Every penny they earned was immediately reinvested into the business, and as a result, money was always tight. The second expression. This is commonly used when you don't have much money and you must be careful about your expenditure. My parents certainly were not poor. We always had plenty of food to eat and a roof over our heads. Although the farmhouse was old and slowly collapsing at the back, as a consequence, there were cracks so large in the wall that cold wind would blow in during the winter months. You might think I'm exaggerating, I'm not. The house was left abandoned before we moved in. The wooden floorboards in the bathroom were so rotten that the bathtub had fallen through the ceiling onto the oven in the kitchen below. My parents had all the essential things that people needed, but it is accurate to say that they had no money to spend on themselves. Curiously, they lived this way for so many years that when they did eventually have money, for a long time they felt guilty spending it. I am only half joking when I say that I more or less survived by drinking goat's milk. If there was no food left in the fridge, there was always plenty of milk on the farm. My parents would tell people that goat's milk is delicious. It must be because their son drank at least three pints a day. It probably was a bit much but I don't think it did me any harm. My parents were industrious people. This means they were constantly working hard and being productive. A lie-in is an informal British noun. It describes when you rest by staying in bed later than usual in the morning. In our house, having a lie-in was not quite considered a crime by my parents, but it certainly was seriously looked down upon and would get you a look somewhere in between disgust and disappointment. My friends used to complain about sleeping the night at my house, 
because if we were not out of bed by 7am, my mum would open the curtains and more or less drag us out. If I ever used to say I was tired, my mum would like to remind me that Margaret Thatcher, the first female British Prime Minister, reportedly only ever slept four hours a night. To which I would like to remind her that she ended up dying of dementia. Like many farmers, my dad didn't do exercise, but he was as strong as an ox and as fit as a fiddle. Here are the third and fourth expressions for you. As strong as an ox is quite easy to understand if you know that an ox is another word for a bull or a cow. If you are as fit as a fiddle, it means you have a very good physical condition and my dad achieved it naturally by running around the farm all day long from one job to the next. I grew up watching my dad work so hard that still to this day, it acts as a powerful source of motivation for me. Or, alternatively, makes me feel guilty if I don't feel like I've worked hard enough. To give you an idea, my dad would wake up at 5am every day and spend two hours milking the goats. He would always say sunrise was the best part of the day and most people missed it. But in the winter, when it is dark, wet and so cold that the milking machine was frozen, it could also be a miserable part of the day. After milking was done, he would then divide his time between running the farm and the dairy. The dairy was the factory where the milk was pasteurised and packed into cartons. At 4pm, he would then start milking all the goats again for the second time. If there were no problems in the dairy, then he would normally stop work before 8pm for dinner. By 8.30pm, he would normally be fast asleep on the sofa in front of the TV. It was my job to wake him up at 10pm so that he could watch the news, but after five minutes, he would normally fall back asleep again. Unfortunately, he snored so loudly that often my sister and I couldn't hear the TV, so we kept having to poke him to wake him up. Thinking about that now, I wish we hadn't done that. My dad was legendary for falling asleep at the wrong time. When my parents invited people over for a dinner party at the weekend, their friends just accepted that after dessert he would literally fall asleep at the table. But nobody ever complained, because we all knew why. We just carried on talking and woke him up when it was time to say goodnight. Incredibly, my mum worked just as hard as my dad, and somehow also managed to look after me and my sister. How she was able to do this is something that I think only other mothers can understand. The hard work and long hours was not something my dad ever complained about. He loved it. He was a farmer and he was living his dream. His energy was fueled by pure passion and enthusiasm. You know when you're in a room with someone like this because the energy is almost tangible. You can feel it in the air. It was only in later life that he told me he regretted not spending more time with us when we were younger. For the first 10 years of my life, we never went on a family holiday. My sister and I would spend our holidays at my grandparents' farm playing with our cousins. We had a great time, but my dad could never be away from his farm for long. After all, goats need to be fed three times a day, seven days a week. I always told my dad not to have any regrets. I remember one of my friend's dads used to work on an oil platform in Siberia. He was away from his family for periods of three months at a time. At least my dad was always there at home whenever we needed him. Like all entrepreneurs, my parents faced many challenges and they didn't make things easy for themselves by doing everything on a shoestring budget. Our fifth expression. This means they only invested very small amounts of money, which was normally not enough for what they really needed. They were afraid to take big loans from the bank. If they had felt more confident about their success, they should have borrowed a million pounds and bought new equipment instead of always buying old second-hand machines that often broke down and caused them endless problems. In the early days, if the milking machine broke down, then they would have to spend all day milking the goats by hand. On one especially challenging day, there was a power cut and they didn't have a backup generator to create their own electricity. 
They had to throw the milk down the drain because they had no way to keep it cold. Thankfully, this only happened once. Back in 1988, when one of the big supermarkets agreed to sell their milk, it was on the condition that they bought a fax machine to receive the weekly orders. Those days, a fax machine was cutting-edge technology. It cost them £1,000, the equivalent of £2,500 in today's money. It took them so many years to pay this off that by the time they had paid the last monthly instalment, a new fax machine only cost £50. I was very fortunate to grow up on a farm. It was the favourite place for me and my friends to play, but it was not always fun and games. If there was a problem in the factory where they processed the milk, it was all hands on deck. The sixth expression. This is used to say that everyone was expected to help out. It originates from when all the sailors would have to run to the deck of the boat and help out in an emergency. It was not very unusual for me and my sister to be helping out late on a school night, loading products onto the back of big refrigerated trucks so as not to miss the strict supermarket delivery deadlines that fresh milk demanded. As a boy, I was extremely shy at times and never liked to be the centre of attention. Whenever the teachers at school would ask about your parents' profession, I would often get embarrassed and turn bright red when it was my turn to answer. Most kids' parents had what I considered to be normal jobs. They were doctors, lawyers or airline pilots. For some reason, when I mentioned goat farmers, the whole class would start to laugh. I don't think they thought there was anything wrong about being goat farmers. It was just so unusual and different that it never failed to provoke giggles and silly impressions of goats. Okay, that was a good one. It was not until my teenage years that I overcame my shyness and I was able to proudly talk about being a goat farmer's son without my face turning as red as a tomato. Another comment I got a few times, which I chose not to believe, was when some kid would shout out that I smell of goats. If you have spent your entire life living on a goat farm, then the smell of goats just becomes normal. You don't notice it, it just smells of home. A bit like how a fish isn't really aware of the water it's living in. It was only when I noticed that other kids who lived on cow farms smelled of cows that I realised that my clothes probably smelled a little bit of goats. I'm sure all this only helped to strengthen my character and develop a healthy level of humility. The story of how my parents became goat farmers thankfully has a happy ending. They had one ambition and that was to farm goats. They achieved their ambition and in the process built a business that far exceeded anything they could have imagined. Over the years, those three goats turned into thousands of goats, providing healthy, natural food for millions of customers. I am proud to say that Delamere Dairy is still producing goat's milk today, along with goat's butter, cheeses, yogurts, as well as a wide range of other speciality milks and products. They're exporting to over 20 different countries around the world, and winning international awards. My parents were especially proud when the company received a special award from the Queen to recognise their achievements. When my parents retired, the business continued to be owned and operated by the same people who spent decades building the company with them. There is still a great team of people growing the business while maintaining the family values that my parents believed in so strongly. It is a shame I was not able to consult my dad for this episode because he was a fountain of great expressions. Sadly, my dad died of cancer five years ago at the relatively young age of 63. But he lived his life to the full and along the way he realised his dream of buying his own farm and would spend many happy hours driving his tractor up and down the fields. There is so much more to this story than I'll ever have time to share with you in this podcast. It was, after all, their life's work. From my perspective, the story is an inspiring one, full of hope and many happy experiences, but certainly not without its share of dark times, failures and heartbreak. It is a beautiful story. I watched how much love that they put into their work 
and witness the daily determination, struggle and sacrifice. It is the combination of the joy and the suffering that makes their story so beautiful. As my dad would always say, the real pleasure is in the journey getting there and not in the final destination. It is like experiencing a sunset. It is always more satisfying after the long, hard climb to the top of the mountain. And that is all I have to say about goat farmers for today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and learned some new expressions. If you would like to learn more British expressions, then there is a new English course available at schoolofduda.com, where, with the help of my polyglot friend, Joanna Olila, we teach over 30 essential British expressions. For the same price as a glass of wine, you can buy a monthly subscription that gives you access to all of my English courses, including this one about British expressions. I don't want financial reasons to ever prevent students from accessing my courses, so if you absolutely cannot afford to pay at this time, then just send me an email and I'll give you free access, no questions asked. If you have any thoughts about this episode, then please leave me a comment on my website under this podcast episode or on Instagram, YouTube or LinkedIn. If you'd like to support this podcast, then please share it with a friend. You can also leave me a review on whichever platform you're on. Okay, thank you once again for listening, and I look forward to talking to you in the next episode. Until next time.